So this is a heart attack or myocardial infarction. And these occur when atherosclerotic plaques build up in the coronary arteries. These plaques typically rupture. Uh, and then there's a thrombus that forms over the site of rupture, and that shuts off blood flow distally. And so the myocardium distal to this coronary occlusion is robbed of oxygen and nutrients, and the cells begin to die. The good news is they don't all die at the same time. There's a progression of cell death that occurs over several hours, and it allows uh, my interventional cardiology friends to go in there with angioplasty balloons and stents and reopen up this uh, occluded coronary artery. Uh, and they've been successful in doing that, and they can do it usually now within 90 minutes of onset of chest pain. And in so doing this, they reperfuse the myocardium and they salvage tissue. However, cells still die, and there's even some suggestion that reperfusion itself uh, may have some deleterious effects, and that's called reperfusion injury. In the United States, there are close to one million myocardial infarctions annually, and despite improved survival rates with early reperfusion therapy using thrombolytics or angioplasty or stenting or combinations, there is still a one-month mortality rate of about 10 percent and a one-year mortality rate of about 13 percent. In addition, congestive heart failure remains a significant morbidity, especially for elderly patients, uh, with about a quarter of patients uh, who are older developing heart failure within one year of their myocardial infarction. A recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that although the time from ambulance arrival to reopening the occluded artery in a catheterization laboratory has shortened in the United States to uh, less than 90 minutes, further shortening of time has not improved mortality. And so better interventions are needed. Better interventions are needed to reduce the size of the myocardial infarction. And we know that heart attack size correlates with mortality uh, and heart failure. And studies have suggested that even a 5% reduction in the size of a heart attack improves clinical outcomes. Now, there are many studies that have looked to try to use adjunctive therapies in addition to reperfusion to further reduce myocardial infarct size. However, sadly, many pharmacologic agents that were cardioprotective in animal models failed when they were, were used as adjunctive therapies for reperfusion in clinical trials. And this uh, table, which is taken from a uh, fairly recent review article uh, that we wrote, lists some of these studies that unfortunately failed. So there have been attempts to give adjunctive therapy with reperfusion, including uh, agents that inhibit uh, the ability of white cells to adhere to uh, endothelium. There have been studies done with sodium hydrogen exchange inhibitors, uh, nicarandol, um, calderet, uh, GIK, glucose, insulin, potassium, a delta protein kinase C inhibitor, erythropoietin. And this is just a short list of many, many drugs that look promising in animal models and unfortunately failed in clinical trials. Now, one, another approach might be to use the body's own endogenous protective systems. And this brings us to the phenomena of preconditioning, which is really the heart's own self-preserving mechanism. Brief periods of ischemia of only two to five minutes prior to a longer duration of ischemia reduces infarct size in most animal models and reduces ventricular arrhythmias. Now, again, ischemia may sound like a bad thing, but two to five minutes of ischemia does not kill myocardial cells, at least in most animal models. Um, it may induce metabolic abnormalities, contractile abnormalities, but it doesn't kill the cells. And if you reperfuse after two to five minutes, the myocardium will recover. Um, so brief periods of ischemia prior to a longer duration of ischemia will reduce the size of a heart attack. And if we can learn the mechanisms of preconditioning, of course, it may lead to potentially important therapies. 
Now, what's the evidence for preconditioning? What does it really look like? It's not an abstract concept. It's something you can actually see very clearly in experimental models. This is a study from our lab uh, by Sharon Hale in which we used a rabbit model of proximal coronary artery occlusion. We occluded the arteries for 40 minutes and then four hours of reperfusion were uh, allowed. Um, and then the animals were either treated as controls or they were preconditioned with two five-minute occlusions plus five-minute reperfusion before the long occlusion. These occlusions occurring in the same artery that we occluded for a longer period of time. And these are transverse heart slices of the left ventricle. The blue areas represent non-ischemic areas as assessed by injecting a blue dye into the vasculature with a coronary artery occluded. So this blue area here is non-ischemic and the same here. Uh, that's not the ischemic bed. Everything that's not blue is within the ischemic bed. The red area represents viable myocardial cells as stained by triphenyl tetrazoleum chloride, and the white areas represent necrosis or the myocardial infarction. So here's a control animal on the left, and you can see there's a very large area of homogeneous necrosis, this white area. And there's a little bit of viable tissue shown here in red. That's controls, 40 minutes of ischemia, four hours of reperfusion. If we subjected those animals to brief five-minute periods of ischemia and reperfusion um, prior to the longer coronary occlusion, you see a lot less necrosis. You have a lot of viable red myocardium here and smaller patchy areas of infarction or these white areas shown here. And this is what preconditioning looks like. It's not some abstract concept. You can see it. You can visualize it. It's a real phenomenon. The first studies that actually reported preconditioning were by Dr. Murray and my former PhD mentors, Dr. Robert Jennings and Keith Reimer, uh, who actually looked at this in a canine model, an anesthetized dog subjected to circumflex coronary artery occlusion for 40 minutes and reperfusion. Animals were either untreated or received brief five-minute periods of ischemia and reperfusion uh, prior to the longer coronary occlusion. And what they observed was that in animals that were preconditioned, there was a marked reduction of infarct size. And when they plotted transmural mean collateral blood flow, which is one of the determinants of infarct size in the canine model, a model that's known to have a lot of collaterals, against area of necrosis over risk zone, uh, they found that for any given um, transmural mean collateral blood flow within the risk zone, your control animals are up here, your preconditioned animals fall below. So for any collateral blood flow, preconditioning reduced infarct size over risk zone. And importantly, preconditioning did not recruit collateral blood flow. So when they looked at collateral blood flow, which was measured by radioactive microspheres to actually measure regional myocardial blood flow in mils per minute per gram of tissue, uh, preconditioning really had no effect on that. So it wasn't that this preconditioning was opening up new blood vessels. That's not the mechanism. Well, this concept of preconditioning has been shown now in just about every animal model of myocardial infarction known in every species, um, and does it occur in humans? Um, there is evidence for preconditioning in humans. Examples include less chest pain, less ST segment elevation, less lactate production, with a subsequent compared to a first angioplasty balloon inflation, reduction in infarct size mortality and heart failure in patients who've had histories of pre-infarct angina prior to an acute myocardial infarction. In other words, brief episodes of ischemia or angina may actually have a protective effect um, prior to an MI. Acute tolerance to angina, the warm-up phenomena. So we often hear of patients who get chest pain when they walk up a hill in the morning on their way to work. They stop, they rest for a few minutes, and then they're able to continue walking without further chest pain. And there have also been studies performed on human cardiac tissue, uh, looking at ATP levels during uh, coronary bypass surgery, in vitro studies on isolated human muscle, in vitro studies on human myocytes in which preconditioning can be mimicked uh, 
basically, um, in these experimental studies. And so it occurs not only in whole animals, it occurs probably in humans, as well as isolated cells and isolated muscle. I had an opportunity to be involved in some of the TIMI studies, which are some of the big clinical trials on myocardial infarction from uh, Eugene Brownwald's group in the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. And we were involved in one such study called the TIMI-4 trial. Um, and in this study of acute myocardial infarction patients, we looked at patients who had had histories of angina versus those who didn't have histories of angina prior to their myocardial infarction. And what we saw was that if you looked at infarct size assessed by CK units, uh, that this was actually reduced in those patients who had angina versus those who did not have angina. So again, a little bit of ischemia here was good. And we also found that those patients who had pre-infarct angina, shown in green, had lower in-hospital death rates compared to those without histories of angina, uh, had less severe heart failure and shock uh, than those without angina, and had a lower composite endpoint of de death, severe heart failure, and shock. So again, little bits of angina were protective. And this has been now confirmed by about a dozen other studies from around the world showing that patients who have pre-infarct angina uh, actually have better outcomes, smaller infarcts, improved left ventricular function, uh, and less heart failure. Now the problem with preconditioning is that it's hard to apply that clinically unless you know the patient's going to have an episode of ischemia. So you could apply it clinically, let's say prior to coronary bypass surgery or some cardiac procedure where you know the heart's not going to be perfused with oxygen. But very hard to apply that to a person who's going to have an acute MI because you don't know when that acute myocardial infarction is going to occur. And you certainly don't want to go in there and uh, occlude someone's coronary artery before they have a heart attack, right? So there's another concept that I think is much more clinically applicable, and that's the concept of remote ischemic preconditioning or ischemic conditioning at a distance. And this refers to ischemic conditioning of one vascular bed that may protect a remote vascular bed. And this could occur within the same organ or between different organs. Now, in 1993, in our laboratory, which at that time was at the Heart Institute of Good Samaritan Hospital, uh, Dr. Karen Schicklink and her husband, Dr. Whitaker, uh, were working on a study with us to look at what would happen if we uh, preconditioned the opposite coronary bed in which we produced a long coronary occlusion. And in this study, preconditioning the circumflex coronary artery bed with brief periods of ischemia and reperfusion, um, when the left anterior descending was then subsequently occluded for 60 minutes, followed by reperfusion, reduced infarct size within the LAD bed. And this showed that brief episodes of ischemia in one vascular bed protect remote virgin myocardium from subsequent sustained coronary artery occlusion in the anesthetized canine model. And this is the data looking at um, uh, control animals or animals that receive circumflex preconditioning. And then we looked at infarct size in the LAD bed in which the coronary artery was subsequently occluded for a longer period of time and reperfused. No difference in the risk zones. Infarct size within the LAD bed was significantly reduced by preconditioning the circumflex bed and the area of necrosis as a percentage of the ischemic risk zone was also significantly reduced. We also uh, took into account regional myocardial blood flow. Uh, we looked at endocardial regional myocardial blood flow within the ischemic zone, uh, looking at area of necrosis over area at risk. Here's control animals. Animals that are preconditioned by, by including the circumflex bed are shown down here. So that was evidence that you could condition one vascular bed and protect another vascular bed within the same organ, but that's kind of hard to do. So we wanted to look at what would happen if we made a limb ischemic, because then you could, then you could uh, 
use that as a potential therapy by simply inflating a blood pressure cuff. So our first study was with uh, Dr. Birnbaum, who was another fellow in our lab in 1997, and he looked at ischemic preconditioning at a distance and showed a reduction of myocardial infarct size by partial reduction of blood supply combined with rapid stimulation of the gastrocnemius muscle in the rabbit. Uh, and so basically applied a stenosis on the femoral artery, uh, and then we stimulated the gastrocnemic muscle to induce ischemia of the lower limb. And when we did this several times prior to a coronary artery occlusion, we reduced myocardial infarct size. And so this showed that remote ischemia of a skeletal muscle could precondition the myocardium. And there have been since numerous studies from many good groups uh, looking at what happens when you simply uh, inflate a blood pressure cuff on a limb uh, and you do this repeatedly. And, and most studies show that this will reduce the size of a myocardial infarction. How does this work? Still debate in this area. We certainly know that uh, four cycles of five minutes of limb ischemia and five minutes of reperfusion are protective. Will actually protect endothelial function in humans as well. It's thought to be that there's some effector, which may be a systemic release of circulating preconditional, pre preconditioning substances. I think Dr. Jim Weiss is gonna address this concept a little bit later in his lecture. There's a lot of theories about what this substance is I'm not convinced it's fully resolved. Initially, we thought it might be something like adenosine or lactate. There's some evidence that miRNAs may be important. Uh, ROS, small amounts of ROS may be important, and you'll hear more about that later. And then cell signaling, um, there's intracellular kinase pathways that may be activated. Um, mitochondria, opening of the ATP-dependent potassium channel, closure of permeability pores may be important, and then there's ultimately protection with decreased neutrophil, pro-inflammatory gene expression and adhesion may play a role, decreased myocardial infarction with reduced ischemic pain, improved function, and there's also now evidence of multi-organ protection during cardiac and non-cardiac surgery, and we'll say a little bit about protection of some of the other organs, primarily the brain, later in the talk. But what's the evidence that remote ischemic conditioning uh, that's been shown in the animal lab can be translated to the clinical realm. And, there, and I want to spend now several minutes with you on some of the clinical trials that have looked at this. I think one of the most important first studies was a paper by Botker and co-workers that appeared in Lancet in 2010. They looked at 333 patients with a first acute myocardial infarction, uh, randomized to primary percutaneous coronary intervention, with or without remote ischemic conditioning, which was four cycles of five minutes of brachial artery cuff inflation and five minutes deflation. And this was actually started in the ambulance when the patient was picked up for chest pain. Then they used nuclear techniques to look at risk zone and infarct size, and they found that mean or median salvage index by myocardial perfusion imaging was 0.75 in a remote conditioning group versus 0.55 in the control group and they concluded that remote ischemic conditioning before hospital admission increases myocardial salvage and is safe. And they plotted here the area at risk as a percentage of the left ventricle versus final infarct size. Um, the red line here represents the control patients who had percutaneous coronary intervention alone, and the blue line represents those patients that had PCI uh, plus remote conditioning. So for any given risk zone, the infarct size was smaller in those patients who received remote ischemic conditioning on their way to the hospital. The same group reported long-term results in this paper by Sloth in 2014. Again, these were a fair number of patients. There were 333 patients with the first acute ST elevation myocardial infarction who had been randomized to primary percutaneous coronary intervention with or without remote ischemic conditioning using the blood pressure inflation technique. The primary endpoint here was major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular events, which was a composite of all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, readmission for heart failure, and ischemic stroke and tragic ischemic stro attack. 
So if you look at these forest plots, uh, MACE, major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events, were significantly lower in those patients who had remote ischemic conditioning. All-cause mortality was lower, and there were trends in the right direction for myocardial infarction and readmission for heart failure. Well, there have been at least 51 remote ischemic preconditioning studies listed at clinicaltrials.gov. That was accessed on 6-10-2016. It's actually a lot more now. And these studies were aimed at investigating the use of remote ischemic conditioning for various conditions in addition to myocardial infarction, including things like kidney transplantation, um, uh, angiopathy and diabetes, and intracranial atherosclerosis. I want to say a little bit about those trials that have looked at acute myocardial infarction because there have been s several of these now in the literature. Um, this lists um, several of these trials, uh, five of them, um, in which upper limb ischemia occurred uh, in the setting of ST elevation MI to induce remote ischemic preconditioning. And these studies have been, for the most part, positive, consistently positive, really, showing reductions in biomarkers for myocardial necrosis, including reductions in um, CKMB release, uh, troponin release. Um, we mentioned the SLOT study, which showed a significant reduction in the hazard ratio for major adverse cardiovascular events. Other studies showing decreases in CKMB. Um, and area under the curve for CKMB, and one actually showing a reduced incidence of contrast-induced acute kidney injury. This is a paper that is taken from Sharma et al. It's a review that looks at clinical trials exploring benefits of RIPC in patients undergoing coronary artery bypass grafting. Now, here the data have been a little bit more mixed. Some studies have suggested that remote ischemic conditioning prior to coronary bypass surgery can, in fact, reduce markers of myocardial necrosis, uh, such as, as uh, um, troponin release and CKMB release. But some of these studies were, were negative, and, and the largest one shown here by Housenly, published recently, was really a negative study. I think it's important to remember, though, that you're dealing with a different kind of patient here. You're dealing with patients undergoing coronary artery bypass grafting. And these patients, the hearts are often protected in advance. So these patients are getting cardioplegia. They're getting hypothermia. Many of these patients are getting anesthetic agents, which themselves may have cardioprotective properties. So in the realm of cabbage, the story has been a little bit more mixed. This is a meta-analysis from LePage. Uh, and again, if you look at primary PCI for acute myocardial infarction and look at this meta-analysis of remote ischemic preconditioning, uh, mo most of these studies are positive, showing reductions in CKMB under the curve and peak CK and a trend towards reduced troponin. So one of the themes that seems to come out of these meta-analyses is that RIPC tends to consistently show a reduction in biomarkers of myocardial necrosis. Again, data are a little bit more mixed for some of these other things, elective PCI. Um, but again, these are less sick patients, and these patients are, um, are not the same as acute ST elevation MI patients. Um, and so it's not surprising to me that uh, RIPC is less positive in these. And then some of these studies also showed benefits even in uh, adult patients undergoing cabbage, showing, I guess, less markers of um, myocardial necrosis. So there's been some very recent meta-analysis that have appeared in the literature, and I'll spend a few minutes with you on those. This is a paper that really appeared just a few weeks ago uh, by Mann and coworkers, looking at 13 remote conditioning trials in acute MI patients, um, again, showing that um, if you look at biomarkers, troponin T area under the curve, a significant reduction with RIPC, uh, a trend towards a reduction in peak troponin T release and peak troponin I release uh, with remote ischemic conditioning for acute MI. 
remote ischemic conditioning has also been shown to improve the resolution of ST segment elevation um, at the time of reperfusion. And there's studies suggesting that the faster the ST comes down, the better reperfusion has occurred, and the less no reflow is present. And so in this recent meta-analysis, if you look at ST segment resolution greater than 70% or 50%, remote ischemic preconditioning seemed to help there. And in this particular meta-analysis, there was also significant reduction in all-cause mortality. Again, this is the ST elevation MI group of patients that we're looking at. Here's another very pretty recent uh, meta-analysis. This is a remote ischemic conditioning to protect against ischemia reperfusion injury. 23 studies in patients undergoing cardiac surgery, PCI, vascular surgery, comprising 1,878 patients. So this study meta-analysis is, is a bit more of a mixed bag. They took different patients uh, with um, different characteristics, ST elevation MI, combined it with um, stable PCI patients, vascular surgery patients. So it's not quite as clean as some of the other meta-analysis I showed you. And in this particular meta-analysis, there was no difference in mortality with remote ischemic conditioning. Um, there was a trend towards reduction of major adverse cardiovascular events, but um, this was not quite statistically significant, as you can see. Um, there was a significant reduction in incidence of myocardial infarction with remote ischemic conditioning. And again, compatible with the other studies I showed you, peak troponin release with remote ischemic conditioning and without remote ischemic conditioning uh, was improved, and this included the cabbage surgery subgroup. So very consistently in the QMI studies, and the CABBAGE studies is this concept that you're reducing the biomarkers, the release of biomarkers of uh, myocardial necrosis, which is, uh, you know, obviously a good thing even when you're having a CABBAGE. So I want to just say a little bit about um, potential applications for ischemic conditioning. Uh, clearly, reducing myocardial infarct size has been pretty consistent um, in terms of showing that RIPC can reduce MI size in humans. Um, reducing cardiac damage during PCI, the data are a little bit more mixed there, but again, this is a very different group of patients, a stable group. Protecting the myocardium during coronary artery bypass grafting, protecting the vasculature during vascular surgery procedures, it might possibly play some role for unstable angina. Before activities that rep reproducibly cause angina in patients with stable angina, maybe protecting donor hearts before excision and transport, and protecting other organs, brain, kidney, during episodes of ischemia. And one of the things that we're currently looking at now from a, with a, a grant from the Department of Defense is whether ischemic conditioning, remote ischemic conditioning, will be beneficial in an experimental model of hemorrhagic shock, which is still one of the largest killer of uh, troops. Now, I want to just say a little bit about um, some of the data in the literature on, on protection of the brain. You're going to hear a little bit more about that later today, but, and these are not my studies, but I was intrigued by them because it's suggested to me that remote ischemic conditioning may not only play a role in protecting the heart against ischemia and reperfusion, but also might protect the brain. And this is one study, um, neurogenic pathway-mediated remote preconditioning protects the brain from transient focal ischemic injury by Mel Horta and coworkers. This was adult Worcester male rats who underwent remote preconditioning or sham surgery. Uh, there was then two hours of middle cerebral artery occlusion. Those having middle cerebral artery occlusion for 24 hours after RIPC had significantly smaller Cerebral infarct volumes at 150 millimeter cube versus controls at 250, as well as better neurologic scores. And interestingly, the ganglionic blocker hexamethonium blocked the benefit. And another theory about remote conditioning that it, is that it might have to do with um, the nervous system and with certain reflexes. Here's a study, upper limb ischemic preconditioning prevents recurrent stroke and intracranial arterial stenosis. This is a clinical trial, 68 cases, 
of patients with symptomatic atherosclerotic arterial stenosis that were diagnosed by imaging. There was bilateral arm ischemic preconditioning uh, with five brief bilateral upper limb ischemia followed by reperfusion, which was done twice a day over 300 days. The incidence of recurrent stroke at 90 and 300 days were 23% and 26% respectively in the untreated control group with a marked reduction at 5% and 7.9% respectively in the preconditioned group. And SPECT measure of cerebral blood flow was shown to be improved in the preconditioning group. This was a study that looked at elderly patients, nonagenarians, um, and also found benefits of remote conditioning, uh, even in elderly, very elderly patients. Um, this was a study looking at 443 patients who had suspected acute stroke using Altapace. They had magnetic resonance imaging, and they found after adjustment for baseline perfusion, diffusion lesion severity, uh, that analysis showed that remote conditioning reduced the tissue risk of infarction. And this concept is now even being extended to looking at uh, long-term cognitive impairment and perhaps even dementia. And I thought this was an intriguing study. Remote ischemic post-conditioning harnessing endogenous protection in a murine model of vascular cognitive impairment by Kahn, published in 2015. This group had previously reported that remote ischemic conditioning during acute stroke conferred, conf conferred neuroprotection and increased cerebral blood flow. They tested whether remote conditioning could augment cerebral blood flow and prevent cognitive impairment um, in a bilateral common carotid artery stenosis mouse model. BCAS was induced with customized microcoils in male mice to establish chronic cerebral hypoperfusion which creates a model of vascular cognitive impairment. One week after uh, BCAS surgery, mice were treated with remote ischemic post-conditioning once daily for two weeks, and cognitive testing was then performed at four weeks. The results, remote ischemic post-conditioning here, improved cognitive function, inhibited inflammatory responses, and prevented cell death, decreased accumulation of amyloid beta protein, and protected white matter integrity. So on this slide, on the upper left, is shown cerebral blood flow. Uh, and you can see here's baseline uh, showing this red area, which represents good blood flow. Uh, the, the top two rows here uh, represent a control animal, and the bottom represents an animal that received remote ischemic conditioning. And you can see that blood flow goes down after the stenosis, uh, partially restored at 28 days. But in the remote ischemic conditioning, uh, blood flow is much better uh, preserved in the, in, the, in the cerebral vasculature. And this is the quantitative data here showing this reduction in cerebral blood flow and that remote conditioning improved that. And then there was also some benefits in the um, neurocognitive testing that were done in these rodents. They had better exploration times and um, um, other cognitive tests were also improved in these mice with remote conditioning. Another interesting finding in this study was that remote conditioning reduced deposition of beta amyloid in the brain. And so here's uh, excess beta amyloid um, shown here in, in the control, and then this is with remote conditioning showing a decrease of this. So there's now a concept that perhaps uh, remote conditioning could actually be extended to look at cognitive abnormalities and perhaps look at his therapies for maybe even dementia. So these are the potential clinical applications of ischemic conditioning. Again, we've talked today about uh, reduction in myocardial infarct size, and that seems to be uh, uh, pretty well determined in the literature. Also, reductions in size of stroke have been demonstrated. But a number of other applications may be important, such as organ procurement for transplantation, perhaps treating hypertension, protecting the kidney from ischemia reperfusion, um, 
Anastomotic leakage, there's some studies suggesting it might play a role, perhaps improving peripheral arterial disease, major surgeries and high-risk patients, pulmonary artery hypertension, and of course sports and performance enhancements, which we'll also hear about uh, later in this conference. So thank you very much for your attention. Retina. Retina. Yeah, okay, we're going to hear about that. That's. Yes, yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks. Well, yeah, so the question is the timing of the therapy, that is the timing of the conditioning versus the timing of the long ischemic insult. So there's several terms that have been used to describe this. And preconditioning was the one that initially was described. Then there was a term called postconditioning where you induce the occlusion, the brief periods of occlusion and reperfusion after you reperfused. That, for our, in our model, has not worked, and we've never been able to show it, although other groups swear by it. Then there's a concept called per-conditioning, and that's really what a lot of the studies that have been done in the, the clinical trials of acute myocardial infarction have used. In other words, Bakker's study started the patient's uh, preconditioning or conditioning with blood pressure, inflations, and deflations in the ambulance after chest pain had occurred, but not after reperfusion. And so there's, there's pretty good clinical evidence that that works. We haven't really looked at that in our experimental models, but per conditioning certainly has been described to work in the clinical trials. So what has not worked for us is post conditioning, and we've tried to show that post conditioning works to reduce infarct size, have not been successful, although it does reduce reperfusion arrhythmias in our model. Yeah, yeah, there are a few studies that have looked at that um, and have not found tolerance, which is good. But that's still, that, 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 there's very few studies on that, and that's something that I think we need, we, we need more information on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, one of the stroke trials I showed you actually did it for something like 300 days, and there was no evidence of tolerance. Those patients seemed to benefit from that, so, yeah. Jim. Yeah, we didn't get into that, right. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, really? Interesting. So it wasn't with ionizing radiation, it was also with some of the anti-carcinogenic. Huh. It was on like lymphoma. So uh, I'm wondering if um, the remote conditioning, which uh, has cognitive enhancement effects, effect, would also stimulate the immune system and be anti-carcinogenic. Because you just added all the yeah. Yeah, I, I know that there's some research being done on the effect of conditioning on, on, on cancer, but I, the details of that I wouldn't be able to tell you, but I think there are some groups who are working on that. It's a fascinating concept. So I guess we would have to say that ischemic conditioning is a hormetic. Did I get that right? It's a hormetic. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, so it's well known that when you have a period of ischemia and you reperfuse, you get, a, you get a burst of ROS. Many groups have shown that. And I think the theory is that a little ROS may be good, it may stimulate some of the pathways that lead to protection, whereas excess ROS is bad, you know, pokes holes in membranes and this sort of thing. So again, the hormetic concept, I guess. I love that concept. That's great. Yes, yeah, there, there have been several studies by other groups, not our groups, that have shown that remote conditioning can protect other organs like kidneys and, and also the GI tract. So there have been studies of ischemia and reperfusion um, uh, where the preconditioning stimulus, again, was a limb where it protected the kidneys from ischemia and reperfusion injury. So yes, it seems to protect more than just the heart or the brain. I haven't looked at that, but other groups may have. Yes? Comorbidities, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so there's a, there's a whole literature on comorbidities and conditioning. And um, uh, s some studies have suggested that certain comorbidities may decrease the ability of conditioning to work. Now, that's not been our experience. And we, one of the first concern was age. And there were a lot of people said, oh, if you've got you know, elderly animals or elderly humans, preconditioning won't work. Well, we looked at this in elderly animals, and it worked. We looked at males versus females, it worked. And then in, as part of the Timmy trial, we went back and we looked at elderly versus non-elderly patients in some of the ST elevation MI studies and looked to see whether Patients who had pre-infarct angina would lose the benefit, and that, that we didn't see that. Um, we're also doing some studies now with diabetes, uh, because some people said, well, diabetic animals may not. So we'll have some answers on that from our own lab, hopefully, uh, soon. I'll take the liberty of the last question. Okay. Um, we're talking about comorbidities. And yes. Potential reason why, why these things might not work. Right, right. That's a long story, but I think that one of the problems has been that, um, I think there's a couple problems. I think one is that some companies have relied on just one or two labs for their preclinical outcomes. And they see a positive result in one lab and they immediately jump into a clinical trial. And I think that that's a problem. Uh, and I think that you have to have multiple labs come up with similar results for some of these drugs before you run in, before you start any kind of a clinical trial. So reproducibility becomes an issue. And, and you can find many, many drugs that have worked in one lab that haven't worked in other labs. Uh, I think that's a big problem. And, and that's, there's some uh, consortiums that have now been developed. Um, we were involved in one with uh, uh, Jim Downey and Derek Yellen a number of years ago where all three labs looked at the same drugs and did pretty much the same experiments. Um, and there's, there's also one called Caesar that Roberto Boli uh, uh, d developed. So I think that that's, that's a big problem. And it might be that, there's, that some drugs that work in animals simply don't work in humans. And I think that that's another issue. I think also some of the clinical trials started the drugs too late after the patients came in. So in other words, if you, you know, there is a progression of necrosis that occurs over time. And if you don't start your drug within the first couple hours after the patient comes in, I don't think anything's going to work. So some of these trials, they look back and the drugs weren't started to 8 to 12 hours after the patients came in. I think it's unlikely you're going to reduce infarct size if you start the drug that late. Okay.
Well, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think that certainly there's enough data now with the ST elevation MI story that I would like to see uh, some of the organizations uh, adapt those into their guidelines for treatment. Uh, that hasn't occurred yet, but I, I, hope, I hope it will. And then I think, you know, in terms of daily lifestyle, uh, certainly exercise is a, probably a very important aspect of conditioning that we should all be doing. Uh, but there, there's also some thoughts that maybe uh, remote conditioning might be something that should be considered in patients with known coronary disease who are at high risk, but those studies have yet to be done. Thank you.